Give me justice, O God, and plead my cause against a nation that is faithless. From the deceitful and cunning rescue me, for you, O God, are my strength. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Fifth Sunday of Lent, friends. Mick Scruff here. I hope that uh, Lent continues to go well for you. Um, kind of getting into the thick of it here. Kind of in the home stretch. Easter's kind of in sight, but it's still off on the or on the horizon line, as it were. And today's readings are kind of, the gospel at least, is kind of challenging. At least for me it was. Because, I mean, you hear in the first reading, the reading from the prophet Ezekiel, where you, you have God speaking to his people saying, I will open your graves and I will have you rise from them and bring you back to the land of Israel. You know, these wonderful signs of power, majesty, of uh, dominion. And then you get the second reading where Paul is talking to the Romans and he's saying those are in the flesh can't please God, but you are not in the flesh, you're in the spirit. And there's this great promise that's associated with being in the spirit. And then we come to the gospel reading and it's, it's almost a little bit confounding in a certain sense. Because we hear about the messengers that are sent to Jesus. And they're saying, hey, uh, this person that you know, this Lazarus fellow from Bethany, is dying. You know, he's very close to death. He's very ill. And then we hear that Jesus remains in the same place for two days. And right before that, we hear, now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. And then he waits and a lot of times, I mean, it's a little bit challenging because it's like, we hear these fantastic things, and then we hear that Jesus knows this fellow and loves them very much, but he, he remains in the same spot for a couple of days. When easily he could go and do this or that, I mean, we hear about the promise, we hear about all of these magnificent signs and wonders that God performs and that God wishes to give people, but there's this holding back almost. And I think there's an interesting correlation to the disciples' reaction to what he does and to our reaction to what God does in a lot of cases. So we hear the disciples, and they're, they're talking amongst themselves, and Jesus hears that Lazarus is ill, but he remains in two places where he was. And then after this, he says to the disciples, let's go back to Judea. And the disciples say, well, wait, the the Jews were just trying to kill you. Why would you want to go back there? So there's a little bit of dialogue that goes back and forth. And finally, he gets to the kind of the, uh, what I think is kind of an interpretive key to what's happening here. He says, our friend Lazarus is asleep, but I'm going to awaken him. All right, so asleep, obviously being used as a metaphor in this, this context. And the disciples say, well, master, if he's asleep, he will be saved. You know, they're kind of thinking on this earthly level almost. Like, oh, he's going to be asleep. Well, he's going to get better if he's asleep. But Jesus is talking about his death. Obviously, it says that right afterwards. And the disciples kind of are thinking, oh, it's just ordinary sleep. And Jesus then says clearly, Lazarus has died. And I'm glad for you that I was not there that you may believe. Let us go to him. So clearly... The disciples are viewing things from a different perspective than Jesus is. They're interpreting what he's saying in sort of maybe the only way that they know how at this point. Maybe it's just that's what seems apparent to them. We're not exactly sure. But there's an interpretive key that comes out that we don't view things the same way that God views things. There's a certain disconnect there. Because, I mean, as it says in Paul's letters as well, God's ways are not our ways. That the, the wisdom of the wise is foolishness to God. That there is a difference between, not necessarily the way that God thinks, but there's a certain difference in the perspective. And, I mean, of course there is. Because, I mean, think about God. He's this omnipotent, this all-loving, all-knowing, all-seeing, and we're not. We're creatures. We have definitive limitations, 
on everything that we do. And Thomas then replies afterwards, and he says to his fellow disciples, let us also go to die with him. That's a curious phrase, isn't it? I mean, there's not many people who would come up to you and just like, oh yeah, voluntarily, yeah, let's, let's go, let's, let's die with him. But I think what's happening there is Jesus has revealed a certain thing. He speaks in sort of a metaphor at first, and then he goes further and reveals it clearly, saying that Lazarus has died. And I think now Thomas sort of gets it to a certain degree. He, the, Jesus sort of extends an invitation into, in a certain sense, a new way of seeing, a new way of understanding what's happening in the world. And Thomas accepts that invitation at that point. And I think that's something that's very critical in the spiritual life. Especially in our culture, we kind of had this culture of individualism, where we're sitting there thinking about things and we're like, oh, well, I have to do all this myself. I have to go do this. I have to, uh, I have to be ambitious and really, you know, a shark that goes out there. And, but in the spiritual life, since we lack the same perspective of God, we can certainly come to knowledge of things about God. We can do our philosophy and we can learn about God and everything. But ultimately, God is person. And when we read this text, it's sort of evident that Jesus comes to us as the initiator to reveal things about himself and about the Father and about the Spirit. There's a certain perspective that we lack that needs to be filled in by the Spirit of God, by Jesus, by the Father. So when we look at Martha and Mary, their reactions to Jesus' coming into Bethany is very different. Martha runs out to him. She says, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that whatever you ask, God will give you. Mar Mary, rather, is a little bit more reserved in a certain sense. She remains behind and she waits. And then Martha comes to Mary and says, the teacher is here and is asking for you. And immediately she rises up and goes to him. So there's this, in a certain sense, difference between the sisters. Martha is very, let's go out and get him. Mary is more of a, I'm going to sit here and await the Lord. I'm going to await him revealing his plan in a certain sense. And that's not to say that it's a role of passivity. It's rather a role more of docility of obedience, of waiting for God to reveal himself and eagerly awaiting that, not just some passive, you know, hands in pockets strolling around, but to wait on the Lord, to be patient and to look and to be more than ready to advance to him when we're called. In advancing there as well, we see in the second reading, what we get is sort of this, this message from Paul that says, you're, the spirit of the flesh cannot please God, but you're not of the flesh. On the contrary, you're in the spirit. And to enter into that spirit, the spirit of God dwells in you. It's the action of God, not the action of ourselves, that draws us near to God. And Although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is alive because of righteousness. It's the spirit of God that gives us life. And it, the spirit of God is freely given, but it also has to be freely received. In order to receive that spirit, there's a certain docility and a certain patience, a certain obedience to get up and go when the master calls. And that's kind of the, the purpose of giving something up during Lent. It's this dying to self, in a certain sense, of subjecting my own will to the will of the Father so that I can listen to him better, so that I can hear him more in the midst of my daily life, so that through a certain sacrifice, he may increase and I may decrease. 
So let's take that forward into Lent. Then we know that it's not us that prays. It's not our action that saves us. It's our response to the action of God, an eager response, but a docile, peaceful, tranquil, and ever vigilant response to that grace. God bless you.